Gracious God, as, as we prepare our hearts to hear your word this morning, I pray that the words of my meditation and my preparation are not of me, but of you. And God, I pray that your words ring through and that you astonish us in an amazing way today. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Now, I know you guys are used to the excellence of the normal storybook reader, but I will, uh, <clears throat> I will do my very best today. I got this. God's got this. So we left off with the Grinch having all the toys and all the presents and all of the, the wrapping and trappings loaded on his sleigh. And then the Who's down in Whoville, he was expecting to hear them cry and boo-hoo. That noise grinned the Grinch, that I simply must hear. So he paused, and the Grinch put his hand to his ear, and he did hear a sound rising over the snow. It started in low, and it started to grow. But the sound, it wasn't sad. Why, this sounded merry. It couldn't be so, but it was Mary, Mary. So he stared down at Whoville. The Grinch popped his eyes. Then he shook, and he saw what a, such a shocking surprise. Every Who down in Whoville, the tall and the small, was singing without any presence at all. He hadn't stopped Christmas from coming. It came. Somehow or other, it came just the same. And the Grinch with his Grinch feet, ice cold in the snow, stood puzzling and puzzling. How could it be so? It came without ribbons. It came without tags. It came without packages, boxes, or bags. And he puzzled for three hours until his puzzler was sore. Then the Grinch thought of something he hadn't before. Maybe Christmas, he thought, doesn't come from a store. Maybe Christmas, perhaps, means a little bit more. And what happened then? Well, in Whoville, they say, Grinch's small heart grew three sizes that day. And the minute his heart didn't feel quite so tight, he whizzed with his load through the bright morning light and brought back the toys and the food for the feast. And the pages stick together in the humidity. <laughs> and he himself, the Grinch, carved the roast beast. So, so the Grinch, he thought he was succeeding. His, his wonderful, awful idea was working perfectly. Everything that had anything to do with Christmas was sitting in his sleigh and ready to be pushed off of the mountain's edge. And at the top, he waits to hear the weeping and the wailing coming from Whoville. But he's shocked that the noise that he hears isn't sad at all. It seems that Christmas came without all the ribbons, the wrappings, and the trappings anyway. And all of Whoville was singing with great joy. Christmas, in part, is about bringing great joy. 
And when I, when I think of joy, I, I think of several things. The sound of a laughing baby. There's nothing that will make you laugh more than a laughing baby. And then the smile on my wife's face when she's not sick. The sound of an old Pontiac hot rod cranking up and idling. I'm an old car guy. And family vacations. Now, I love me some good family vacations, and I'm always looking for good ideas. And since we're lighting the, the candle of joy and celebrating joy for Advent today, I thought, why not talk about vacations? So I want to hear what you guys do for vacation. So on the, we're going to play my favorite game. We're going to shout out on the count of three, one or two words of things you love to do on vacation. Ready? One, two, three. That's what I thought. That's what I thought. That's good. I heard whitewater rafting. Because I love whitewater rafting. And it's a bit tough to do here in St. Pete because we don't have any white water. We've got kayaks, but that's a completely different thing, and it just doesn't, it's just not the same. So I don't get to go rafting as often as I used to. But I love the, the, the technical scenic rivers in the east, you know, the, the, the beautiful gorges and the trees and all of that. And, and I love the, the wild rolling rivers out west. I've done two trips down the Colorado River through the Grand Canyon that were just amazing trips. And I love all the, the family-friendly rivers and rapids up around the Appalachian Mountains. But my absolute favorite is the Chattooga River. It forms the border between Georgia and South Carolina, and I've been playing on that river since I was a kid, and I, I brought up our seven kids with the intent that they would love that river as much as I do. And one of our most memorable trips down that river was the first time my little David, our little David, our youngest, was old enough finally to go on the big river. He had just turned eight years old, and I was stoked. I was, I was pumped. His, his, his siblings and Nicole, they were all excited. We were just finally going to get to go together on the river as a family. And I'd been anticipating this day for a long time, and I wanted my family to experience the love and adventure of going over the world-famous Class 4 Bull Sluice Rapid. It's just a blast. And I may have been feeling a little big for my britches that day, and I, I thought I'll send the older kids down with the younger, inexperienced guide, and Nicole and myself and little David will jump in with the senior guide, and we'll go ahead and we'll show them how to do this rapid, right? We'll show them how it's done. So here we are. We're taking off. We're going down Bull Sluice. And when we finally got there, you know, I thought we, we decided we were just going to shoot on through. That didn't happen, right? Right? I was expecting to just go down, you paddle to the right, you paddle to the left, you bounce off the rock, you go down the rapid, and you come out and you cheer, and everything is fine. But poor little David at the time was like 70 pounds soaking wet, and he was in the front of the boat, as you can see. So there was no weight in the front of the boat. And when we went to bounce off the big rock on the left, we went up on the rock and the raft flipped over instead. And of course they have cameras there because this is the big great photo spot. And we have pictures of David flying through the air and what appears to be Gary standing on Nicole's head in the water. And when the whole flipping thing was done, I actually came up out of the water. I had David in one arm, and I had two paddles in the other, and I trusted that Nicole would make her way to the shore all by herself. She did. She did. And that, that raft full of laughing teenagers, they made it perfectly. They hit it just like they were supposed to. They came down, and they, I don't think, will ever let me forget that trip. 
but I wanted them to experience an adventure that they would never forget. And Nicole will never let me forget that trip. She reminded me of it last night as I was rehearsing this sermon for her. She, in her sixth state that she was in, she still said, yeah, I will never forgive you for standing on my head. So. <laughs> but in the end, flipping and everything, and, and, you know, all in, we still found great joy in that trip, right? That, that moment, that family time together, that experience, it all brought us great joy. So anyway, back to the who's. For them, all the stuff that was loaded on Grinch's sleigh was not what made Christmas. It's not what brought the joy of Christmas. They still gathered together in community in song. And we can't be sure just what the Grinch heard that transformed his heart, but we know that it was some kind of music. And music has this unimaginable power to move us like nothing else. Think about movie music. Those, those minor keys, they take us into that dark and gloomy place, right? Think Darth Vader's theme and stuff like that. And, and then those, those, those uh, major notes, they, they bring us up and they, they just pick everything up and keep us happy and, and moving along. And our bodies, they just, they just respond to the vibrations and the sounds of the music. And this is why music is such a, a, a part of almost every culture. It's just a, a part of what makes us who we are. Music is a powerful gift from God. It's, a, it's just fundamental to our human experience. Can you imagine what worship would be like, our time together, if there was no music. It's no surprise that the Advent and Christmas season is saturated with music. And what other time of the year do radio stations and, 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 sh and stores change their, their soundtracks? Our favorite carols and hymns, even though they don't all talk about Jesus, we don't sing about Jesus and all of them, they take us to Christmas. They lead us there. And I wonder what is your favorite Christmas carol? So we're going to play the game again. On the count of three, what's your favorite Christmas carol? One, two, three. That was weak. Must have been silent night because I didn't hear it. <laughs> On the count of three, one, two, three. Oh, holy night. I heard that and I agree. Oh, holy night. A thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices, for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. Truly he taught us to love one another. His law is love and his gospel is peace. Chains shall break, for the slave is our brother, and in his name all oppressions shall cease. Sweet hymns of joy and grateful chorus raise we. Let all within us praise his holy name. That song has such beautiful harmonies in it. And those lyrics were just made for Advent. And sometimes music communicates what words cannot. Some of the most Im impactful worship that I've ever experienced was, was in a concert field. Or in a, a huge arena or even on the side of a mountain at Red Rocks in Colorado. But music can move us. It can mold us and change us. Music even has the power to grow the Grinch's heart three whole sizes. Music is like a, a natural outflowing of joy. Music and joy, they just, they just go together. It's like when, when Mary and Elizabeth meet and the, the child in Elizabeth's womb leaps for joy. And Mary responds with what we traditionally call the Magnificat or Mary's song. And that's in Luke 1, 39 through 47. It's 
says, Mary got up and hurried to a city in Judea highlands. She entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was, was filled with the Holy Spirit. And with a loud voice, she blurted out, God has blessed you above all women, and he has blessed the child you carry. Why do I have this honor that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as I heard your greeting, the baby in my womb jumped for joy. Happy is she who believed in the Lord would fulfill the promise he made to her. And Mary said, and Mary sang, With all my heart I glorify the Lord in the depths of who I am. I rejoice in God my Savior. This is the word that God has prepared for us today. So, joy, even the baby in Elizabeth's womb, the child that we would someday know as John the Baptist leaped for joy at the arrival of the unborn baby Jesus. Galatians 5, and 23 tells us that, that joy is one of the fruit of the Spirit along with peace and love, as well as patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And I'm going to seminary geek out on you here for a minute, but follow along. The Greek word for joy is chara or hara, and that's derived from the word chero or hario, which is the root of the word for charis, which is Greek for grace. You following me? That's a lot of Greek in a short amount of time, but basically it means that grace and joy come from the same place. And joy is produced by the grace of God. So joy is it's not a, a human-based happiness that, that comes from 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 within us, but rather true joy comes from our triune God. For the who's, their joy was not who made or, or even Grinch destroyed. And Dr. Seuss never actually ties it to God or the baby Jesus or the Holy Spirit, but it comes from something deeper than just all the stuff that was packed on the sleigh. It was rooted in love. And because of this, the story wasn't over. The Who's had every right to be angry. They had every right to stomp their little furry feet and march up Mount Crumpet and, and demand their Christmas goods back. They had every right to demand justice and take revenge on that mean old Mr. Grinch. And this is what I, why I say that the story is rooted in God. The joy in Whoville was from the same root as grace. The Who's had grace for the Grinch. And recognizing this truth is what, what caused his heart to grow. If they had not shown grace to the Grinch, how long would his heart have stayed three sizes bigger than it once was? It's one thing to have a, a changing heart, but it's another for that change to remain trusted and true and for that person to be welcomed in as part of a community. And at the end of the story, you see that the Grinch was still welcomed as a guest around the table, just as we are welcomed into relationship with God. And at the, the end of the story, we see that the outsider, the other the Grinch, the one that should have been feared and excluded, is at the head of the table carving the roast beast as they all sit together in fellowship at the table. And Matt Rawl points out that in this final panel of the book, the wreath behind the Grinch almost looks like a halo. 
And even though the gospel isn't explicit in the story, the, this simple final drawing implies that something beautiful and holy has happened in the hearts of those that are sitting at the table. How often does God welcome us back to the table, encourage us, and encourage us to, to, to invite one another to dine with him as well? The Advent season is the, the beginning of the liturgical year. It's a, a new beginning and a, a new chance to, to walk through the life of Jesus. And the word Advent actually means arrival or coming. And it marks the, the four weeks prior to Christmas and a time which we, we prepare to celebrate the first coming of our King in Christ Jesus. We also prepare for his return even though he's still here with us. Because joy is a steadfast assurance that God is with us. Even when our heart isn't as big as it should be. And maybe that's the real story of Christmas. God putting on flesh, not only so our hearts may grow three sizes by making room for joy, but to show us how to welcome even the Grinch among us to make room for each other. So think about what brings you joy this Christmas? Is it music? Is it sitting around a table? Is it fellowship with friends? Is it uh, family vacations that hopefully don't involve dumping your wife in a river and standing on her head? No matter what that joy is, remember that joy is rooted in God. Joy comes from knowing our Lord. And through the, the Who's song, the Grinch discovered that Christmas is not about packages. It's not about the food, the presents, the ribbons, the bows, the trees, the garland, the lights. The joy of Christmas is about love. And Jesus is what God's love looks like. And that is what Christmas is all about, Charlie Brown. But that's a different story for another time. Amen? Amen.